Adam, welcome to the cold memo. It's it's a pleasure to be able to speak with you again. Uh, we'll tell folks where we met in a moment. But first, you know, I'm seeing all this chatter on Twitter and I'm hearing all about it. People are seeing THC beverages and uh, cannabis products pop up on shelves across the United States. Uh, briefly, can you tell us what, what's going on here? Why is how is this able to happen? Uh, this is able to happen because in 2018, Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump legalized cannabis in the United States under uh, a specific set of circumstances, but de facto legalized edibles in the U.S. That is very well put. Folks, you're listening to The Cole Memo. I am your host, Cole Preston. Every episode is released in audio, video, and transcript format. To find the transcript, audio, or video version of any episode, please refer to the description of the episode that you're listening to. Within that description, you'll find a link which will take you to our website, which will display the transcript and the platforms where you can find the episode in audio or video formats. If you're unable to locate the episode description on whichever platform you're listening from, I get it. Every platform is different. Simply note the episode number and visit thecolememo.com. From there, you can find the corresponding episodes, and then you'll be able to find the audio, video, or transcript version of that episode. You might also find any links that we reference during this episode. We will be referencing a few so that you might be able to do your own research or purchase some tasty products. If you're not listening to this episode of The Cole Memo on Patreon, then you're listening to this episode later than our patrons. To become a patron, go to thecolememo.com slash Patreon. It's a great way to support our show. One of the best ways to support our show is free. Subscribe to, follow, or share our show. Your engagement and support is appreciated. Today is November 8th, 2023, and I am joined by Adam Terry from Cantrip. I got your name right. Um, I'm surprised with myself. I'm generally bad with names. Drinkcantrip.com. That's the website, right? That is the correct website. And come on, my name's probably one of the easier ones you're going to get on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I just wanted to show a picture really quick. You mentioned Mitch McConnell. There he is with his pen, his hemp pen. Um, <laughs> oh, really? I didn't, I didn't know that existed. That's great. Yeah, yeah. He was proud. He signed the bill with his hemp pen. Here he is signing the finalized farm bill. He was very proud of that. Um, so as he should be he did a great service to this country he just didn't realize what that would mean right right and so uh before we get into to what you might have just meant by that uh tell us a little bit about uh drink cantrip yeah so thank you for that it's great to be here uh cantrip is a uh cannabis beverage we actually started out in the dispensary system in massachusetts we've been working in cannabis for quite a while always wanted to create a beverage we started out with some low dose offerings here in the dispensary system and just last year in 2022 uh, we started making the same products from hemp and uh, selling them in minnesota tennessee texas new jersey minnesota and you know a broad set of uh, states if you order from us directly online uh, we make uh, a pretty broad array of products. We have low-dose seltzers, 3 milligrams of THC, or 5 milligrams of THC. We have sodas in 10 milligram and 50 milligram formats. And we have an energy drink in a 10 milligram format as well. So we are really trying to be the cannabis drinks company, trying to have a, a broad set of products to you know really meet people where they are rather than try to force them into either a low-dose or high-dose kind of format and you know uh, bring... Uh, I, I think of it as drink uh, accessibility for drinks by creating a wide set of drinks. You can meet more people where they're at. Very cool. Very cool. And uh, it's always interesting to hear about folks. It's not the first time we've heard it, but I always like to, to make sure to uh, acknowledge it. You just said, you know, you've uh, were in dispensaries and now, you know, you're operating in the hemp space. I even think I saw a, a viral article uh, that maybe your products were featured in. Am I wrong in thinking that you were in that article that went viral about the the liquor shops in Minnesota that that is carrying? Oh, the, uh, yeah, total, so Total Wine and More, which is a national retailer yeah. uh, for beer, wine, and spirits, one of the biggest in the country, just started carrying THC beverages in Minnesota only. But you know, um, since Minnesota codified the Farm Bill loophole in into law in 2022, there's now hundreds of brands in Minnesota and elsewhere that have been uh, working their way into that market. So I'm, I'm particularly proud that Cantrip made it onto that set. It's really just a big news for the category as a whole that 
national retailers are finally taking this seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like I say, it's, I saw it go viral. I didn't really understand the significance of it, but it's, it's apparently that it's a pretty big, well-known chain that's carrying these beverages. Yeah. There. You know, there's not like a direct comparison to like Target or Walmart or something, just because this country has such varied and different liquor laws, which is actually one way that liquor laws are similar to hemp laws. Uh, but the you know Total Wine is one of the largest retailers of beer, wine, and alcohol in this country. Uh, they are also you know they're well known for you know it's similar to how Walmart became well known for trying to put mom and pop shops out of business. Total Wine is kind of that for uh, for the liquor industry. It's not it's not really beloved by a lot of local retailers, but they are pretty serious when it comes to moving volume. Um, they have one of the most bizarre pricing structures I've seen so far for any retailer. Um, is you you probably know that in like dispensaries typically stuff is priced about how much THC is in there. Um, it, this the total one is decided to price based on the sum total of THC and CBD, which is actually made Cantrip I think the cheapest thing on the shelf because Cantrip is one of the few that doesn't have CBD in most of our products, and so you can get uh, Cantrip at a total one for ten dollars for a four pack, which is the cheapest place in the country um, to to purchase it. But I mean, it's just kind of a test. Uh, I think a test thing for them. They only have three stores. They're doing this in, I think that's because at, in Minnesota, there's so many states or uh, cities that have put moratoriums on selling uh, hemp, hemp derived THC products that only three of the total wines actually could sell these products. Mm. But we uh, we're pretty confident that this is a precursor to them doing that in other states. Tennessee is a pretty permissive hemp law, for instance, that uh, that pretty well covers hemp derived THC. And Tennessee also happens to be a pretty big state for total wine. Um, so every state that Cantrip currently retails in is a decent total wine state. And so we're hopeful that we will make it into all of those total wines within the next you know, 365 days or so. Yeah. It's a little interesting that this arena, this is one of the areas where federal law is, I would say, ahead of state law. Would you agree with that? Yeah, although not completely on purpose. Uh, the, uh, sure. I mean, it's it is really interesting that um, that the far, the U.S. Farm Bill. You know, if we if we want to talk about it like that just for a second and kind of like Please. what the basis of all this is. So in 2018, the uh, what is it? I think it's called the the actual name of it was like a uh, U.S. Agricultural Act or something like that, uh, known as the U.S. Farm Bill. It's renewed every five years. It contains all sorts of things like you know uh, crop subsidies and farm subsidies and um, you know food benefits. All sorts of different things that are important to our our agricultural system. And in 2018, they added a a part of it that legalized hemp. For you know the the point of that being that it was going to be there for industrial purposes. Hemp is a really versatile plant. As many know, it can be used in making concrete and plastics and all sorts of stuff because of the amount of lignin in it. Most famously, it was historically used for, to make rope back in the day. You know, there's lots of references to hemp and rope um, from uh, you know the, the founding fathers' times. So they, they put this standard in the farm bill, which says, uh, to paraphrase, because I don't know if I have the exact language, you're going to have uh, Delta 9 THC, you can grow hemp as long as the Delta 9 THC content is not above 0.3% on a dry weight basis. And that is kind of the extent of the language they put in there. Um, it's really, really not comprehensive in terms of what you can cover with that. But what they what they effectively did is they managed to legalize this, you know, the cannabis plant under these specific conditions. Um and the intention of that was to be able to have CBD and oh, I don't know if I actually tend to have CBD, but to have these these industrial products without creating a system where you could smoke flour, right? If you're buying flour and it's 0.3% THC, it's probably not getting you anywhere or at least not very far, kind of like the equivalent of non-alcoholic beer. But the fact is not a single one of the senators had any, had any sense of like what happens when you do the math on edibles. Edibles weren't, you know, I think on their radar when they made this and it turns out an edible you know, can be pretty large by weight. So your absolute concentration of THC doesn't need to be very high in order to deliver an effective serving. Like just on the, the, the most frequent example I use because I'm from Massachusetts. Well, actually I'm from New York. Anyway, is that a, uh, you can have only up to five milligrams of THC in an adult use marijuana edible, uh, or at least in a serving here in Massachusetts uh, in a, that most gummies are around three grams. So if I was going to go by the farm bill standard, I could have up to nine milligrams of THC 
in a three gram gummy, which is more than I can actually put in a dual use gummy in Massachusetts. So based on whatever the weight of your actual finished product is, you can put quite a bit of THC. Um, and then they really didn't do themselves any service by putting the words dry weight basis in there because that's very confusing language, to be honest, especially when it comes to beverage. Uh, but, you know, by that token, they essentially legalized Delta 9 THC in this country. Um, you know, the, the short version of the story after that, like what actually happened was uh, the FDA had no idea what to do as soon as that happened because CBD became a giant question. Earlier in 2018, actually, is when Epidiolex, which is an epilepsy treatment for pediatric patients, the first uh, uh, FDA-approved therapy that had CBD in it uh, was approved six months before the Farm Bill came out, which meant that immediately CBD became legal and immediately became questionable as an additive to supplements and food products because the FDA has a rule which says if it's in a drug, it can't be in food. <laughs> I mean, it's like the simplest level of that. And so the FDA then spent five years saying, we're going to consider this question and see what we can do about it. Only to earlier, I think this year, maybe it was like the beginning of 2023, said, we have no idea what to do about this. Congress is going to have to act. And, you know, Congress isn't doing much of anything these days. Uh, it, it was, there were a few companies that were making Delta 9 products from THC. I actually personally didn't even, it didn't even occur to me to make an edible from hemp until I went to apply for a trademark for my company. And it was denied on the basis that we were above 0.3% THC by weight, which is not true <laughs> on its face. It was not true. Um, and then I realized you could maybe do this. And I realized there are a couple of companies doing it, but no one really took it seriously until Minnesota legalized, you know, essentially codified this loophole, loophole in their uh, uh, in their state law on July 1st of 2022. And the way that came about is, an, uh, is its own funny story about Republicans just not reading the text of legislation. But once that happened and sort of there was this 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 air support from a state that was basically saying this is our interpretation of the farm bill. We believe this to be true. We're making this true in state law. It, everything just kind of broke loose there. And since then, that was the real starting gun for cannabis beverages, because I think a lot of us were actually having trouble finding our market in the dispensaries. And so to be able to produce in a single place, distribute essentially nationally with traditional retailers and traditional distributors has entirely changed the game for the, the category. Yeah. And some of the things you've said, I've heard others say, you know, like uh, this came about by accident. Some people also call this a loophole. Do you think it's fair to say that, and I think this isn't, it's not like this counters what you says, but said, but do you think it's fair to say that this, this is a result of legislators not understanding what they're legislating? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's pretty fair to say. Uh, it, it's not just legislators either. I mean, regulators, even in Mar I've been in like the marijuana industry, you could say for since 2015. And I hate to use that term, but we now really have to make a distinction between marijuana and hemp because Cannabis is both of those, at least scientifically speaking. Right. Um, and funny, if you ever talk to somebody from Canada, they'll just look at you like you're crazy because they don't make a distinction there. Um, but the uh, uh, the right, like you look at every single state law, every state law has like weird loopholes and ways to bypass things that the even people who actually do understand what they're trying to regulate, it's hard to craft language that excludes things in such a specific way. I mean, look at Massachusetts. People are now, Massachusetts has this very specific language that says a beverage may not be more than five milligrams, but it also says a tincture can be up to a thousand milligrams. And it doesn't give that much distinction about what the difference between a beverage and a tincture is. A tincture is something that you can delineate a serving for very clearly to meter it out. That's in the guidance issued by the CCC. But, you know, does a cap count? Like if you put like a dosing cap or give somebody a shot glass, does that count? And can, what's the difference between a beverage and a tincture when it comes down to it? There really isn't that much um, because the, the definition of tincture has been warped by the cannabis industry. Tincture used to just mean herbs extracted into alcohol. Now it's got a much broader meaning. And so, you know, I've seen competitors launch these more than five milligram beverages into Massachusetts. They just don't say beverage on them. And so, you know, there's, that wasn't intended by the regulators either, but when there's consumer demand for something, people will find a way. And frankly, I'd rather see Delta 9 products being sold everywhere than Delta 8 products or THCO or HHC or THCP or any of these other four or five letter designer acronyms that we don't have any, you know, any historical knowledge of. Yeah. And to your point, uh, yeah, I, I, that's one of the main reasons I've been very excited to speak to you today. Um, you you make 
products that I will unselfishly plug once again, uh, you know, 50 milligrams of THC. I do like that. I, I read a little bit into the fine print. I do like that. Technically speaking, it's a can that has five servings in it and you can reseal it for folks that maybe uh, aren't ready to take a wild side, ride on the wild side like myself. Right. Um, you know, they could just add a little bit to their drink is, is 50 milligrams wild for you i have a, no, <laughs> I have a no, feeling like that's not <laughs> no but for most people i think it's like you know yeah. starters they may not well, there, there's for... there's a couple things i know to be true after being in this industry first of all there's some people who like even i know people who are not frequent consumers who can drink 25 milligrams no problem I have been consuming cannabis for 15 years and I can't drink more than like 10 milligrams without having kind of a problem personally. Um, really? And I used to smoke eight times a day, you know, like sure. I've, I've cut down quite a bit in the last few years. Ironically, since joined the cannabis industry, I just had less time than I, than I, you know, before when I didn't have as many jobs, but the, um, uh, the dosing profile to me is like, it is important to be able to meet people where they are and offer somebody something that you know they actually want or that actually works for them there are people who just have higher therapeutic thresholds or just higher tolerances or their body doesn't process it that well we've all heard the stories of people who just say that edibles just don't work for them no matter how yeah. much they take or they need to take like a thousand milligrams um so offering 50 seemed like the best way to go and either we consider so we made an internal standard at cantrip that five milligrams is a standard dose anything below that's a microdose. anything above that is multiple serving. So we put 10, we put like lines on the side of the can. We have reclosable lids on everything above five milligrams that actually do fully reclose and like seal in, you know, the, the carbonation and everything. And so about like for the 50 milligrams, it works out to about a shot glass is going to be like a single dose. So we have kind of like a spirits analogy as well. Right. So we, we do as much as we can to communicate. Uh, but I'll be honest, I think most of the people buying the 50 milligrams are just down in them. I mean, I actually consume them the way that they're intended. I'll be you know perfectly clear about that. When I, you know, the way I like to consume is like I'm on a Saturday, say it's Saturday, I'm breaking leaves. So I'll go to the fridge, take a swig, and then, you know, come back like an hour or two later, take another swig. Kind of like, you know, uh, somebody might hit a bowl, but I don't right. really smoke cannabis anymore all that much just because it, it doesn't fit with, you know, having, you know, a, a young baby and a wife that doesn't smoke and all sorts of stuff like that it just doesn't make as much sense for me. Um, but the 50 milligrams, I just take a swig. I don't need to drink a whole can of liquid and, and just get on with my rigging. That's really cool. Yeah, that's really cool. And like I say, uh, it's it's so cool to hear that, like like you said earlier, these products, it's almost like the question that I started with. It seems like uh, we're ahead of state law again in this sense, at least in my case in Illinois. And it sounds like you gave an example of Massachusetts where, yeah, you're not. Well, actually, I take that back. You can find some syrups and I think maybe a soda here in Illinois that's that's like 100 milligrams. I think you guys have more loose interpretations of what like a multiple serving product is. Like right. Massachusetts was the first state I know that had like specifically said a beverage may only be a single serving. That's like an actual line in the regs. Right. Whereas like California said, okay, 10 milligrams is a serving and you can have up to 100 milligrams in a bottle and there's not much more past that. So like Uncle Arnie's is a super popular beverage out in California. It's 100 milligrams, it's eight ounces. They also do like reclosable caps and dosing guidelines on the side. Um, and you can do that in California, you can do it in Colorado, you can do it in a lot of states, I'm sure. <laughs> to be honest, I don't know all of them off the top of my head, but the um, Massachusetts was like, you know, my market and it was the one market I couldn't make more than five milligrams. And I used to go, you know, do all the tablings at dispensaries myself, you know, I'm the founder of the company, always helps me with product to go in and we would taste people on uninfused product. And the number one thing I got asked all the time is when are you guys going to make something stronger than five milligrams? And I said, when well, Massachusetts changed their laws, because there's not much else you can do in dispensary, you know. At first, it's more expensive to make stuff for the dispensary system because the licenses are harder to work with. It's the dispensaries all mark stuff up more than other businesses because they have to cover more overhead. So these things were going like seven dollars on the shelf for a five milligram beverage when everything launched in mass. And, you know, that's just not sustainable for anybody who has anything above like a, a, a regular tolerance. And even for people that are drinking one of these a day, that's, you know, that's pretty expensive. So to get both the price point down and to get, you know, a more expansive set of, um, of products that could help more people, you know, working in hemp is kind of the only way to do that. Yeah. 
And I'm about to pull up a uh, graphic that Box Brown made. I'm sending it to myself because I'm having trouble pulling it up on my computer. So I'm about to email it to myself. Funny logic there. Um, but uh, can you, you know, we talked on Twitter about like the potential of this. And obviously you said there were there were maybe some shortcomings, but just hypothetically speaking, just to really lay this out for folks, uh, what this hemp uh, farm bill allows you to do. You could hypothetically have, like you said, up to like a thousand milligram soda, right? It may not taste great, but hypothetically I'm actually, speaking. Well, I'm glad you asked that question because I think that's actually not totally clear okay. um, because the language without the farm bill actually says, remember I said it's the dry weight basis is kind of a confusing piece of language. So mm -hmm. the reason it says dry weight basis is because what it meant was after cure, uh, cure and dry in a plant. Mm -hmm. Now, I so I used to actually do a lot of extractions. So I know a fair amount about drying cannabis. That was a big part of what we did. And after a like a regular dry cycle for cannabis, you typically the you have like 70% water weight after the harvest. Like the the like the plant itself might be around 70%, say like the buds we're talking about. After your dry cycle, uh say your your two-week hang or however you're doing it, probably end up with about 30% water weight. And so when they're considering it, they're considering it on a dry weight basis means 30%. Now, I'm not a hemp cultivator, so I'm not sure if there are additional steps that the USDA looks at, which is like when I would dry it for extraction purposes, sometimes we would dry stuff in a crucible to get it all the way down to 0% water weight just to do some you know kind of uh, research. And so they could be considering that. But, you know, what does dry weight mean for a beverage? If we're going to go by like the most literal definition you could take, you'd have to say, okay, you boil off all the water and then measure it. And is it still below 0.3%? Right. Done That's the, dry weight for a wet product. Well, part of my <laughs> products are actually, you know, they are, if you boil them down, still below that that uh, limit on a dry weight basis. But say you have like a sugar-free and very light flavoring beverage. So you like just had a straight seltzer with THC in it. If you boil that off, we'd still be under 0.3%. I don't know. And so if you had a thousand milligram beverage and a 355 gram, uh, you know, which is a standard like a uh, beverage weight for like a 12 ounce, you might be compliant or you might not. That question has never been tested in court. Um, and so that is kind of an, an open, uh, interesting question for the farm bill that applies specifically to beverage in an interesting way. Yeah. And I don't think the industry has like a consensus around what that means. Most people just take it to me, like be straight up 0.3% on a weight basis. But I don't know, dude, it's hard to say when stuff hasn't been tested in court and there's really no uh, precedent to, to go off of. Right. But I guess just a good visual representation. Again, we love Box Brown. I love this yeah, panel he's, he's here. Fun. He cyber bullied me once on Twitter, but he then, you know, we, we made up after that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't actually remember what it was about. That was a couple of years ago, but uh, he's an intense guy, but I really like his comics. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I think that's a that's a fair description of him. Intense guy, but we like his comments, <laughs> comics. Anyway, uh, this uh, panel here, I think, is a good graphical representation for folks. Like, until I saw this, it wasn't clicking for me. And, and I know that based on what you just said, maybe this isn't no, that's perfect. Accurate. This is good. That, that's right? perfect. I mean, gummies have the one weird thing where they, they also have like bonded water in them. I won't get too much into like the science of that, but like sure. that's a perfect representation. Like ignoring that is same. It would be the same for like a chocolate, but yes, as long as that THC is under 0.3% in that graphic, you are. Yeah, so I, I think clear. like of a drink too. So like when the case of the drink, we were just talking as long as, you know, the, the amount of the, you've got your drink here, but then you've got this, as long as this is under 0.3%. Mm -hmm. right right and so if you want to make you know a 10 milligram gummy instead of a five milligram gummy just you know double the size of your gummy that's right. really all it takes <laughs> and people right. might not be, hate that they might be like all right i get more gummy too yeah no that's that's hilarious i was just about to make that point yeah so if you need more thc well then just double the volume so that yeah you're keeping you're keeping yourself to that point three so it's interesting times, very interesting times. I wanted you to uh, take something on that, that you already kind of addressed on Twitter, uh, but but I think it's important because this is what seems to come up when this conversation is had. People say this is a big threat to the cannabis industry. What say you? 
Um, it's only as much of a threat as they want it to be. I mean, like, let's be real and look at the numbers, right? 15% of dispensary sales are edibles and edible based products. So that's the first of all, we're talking about. It's not the vast majority of what dispensaries are making and selling. Um, the threat to them on those, I guess, would be like Delta 8 flour and stuff like that. But 13 states have already banned Delta 8, maybe 14 now. And uh, I'll, I think we're going to see a lot more crackdown on like designer cannabinoids and synthetic cannabinoids as well. Minnesota is an interesting state bill. But when it comes to the edible side of it, it's like it's interesting because edibles are really where brands thrive in MSOs. Like think about Incredibles for GTI, right? That's an incredibly successful um, brand that they carry uh, and it's entirely based on edibles. They could launch that tomorrow on the hemp side. They already know how to make them. Um I don't think it would take them a tremendous amount of effort. And I'm sure they have enough money and people to pay the resources to find like the right co-packers or just even like a warehouse space that they could move equipment into um, and, you know, source the, T the THC. It's not that complicated. The only reason they're not doing it is, is out of an assessment of risk profile, because there is, you know, there's always a risk to doing it that, I don't know, the FDA wakes up tomorrow and says that this is a problem that they're actually going to take seriously or, you know, uh, I think honestly what it comes down to for a lot of these MSOs might be like the fact that they're publicly traded stocks and they don't want to risk anything that could be construed as breaking federal law. Um, but the ironic part is they're already breaking federal law every day. So I, I, I really am not super clear on the risks. I think when you look at like the my category specifically, the beverages, there's a couple beverage brands that are owned by MSOs. I haven't seen any single one of them actually make the jump into the hemp side. Uh, like Levia, for instance, it was a used to be an independent competitor to us in Massachusetts. It was acquired by Air Wellness. I have not seen them launch on the hemp side of things. I think the only one that I've really seen that I I was I'm pretty sure owned licenses on the cannabis side or on the marijuana side was Keef Cola. They're now in the hemp space, and I think they actually had their own marijuana licenses. They might be the almost everybody else I know, they never held a marijuana license. So Cantra, for example, we never held right. a license. We worked with licensed producers to get our product made in their facilities and then sold through the dispensary system. But essentially we were licensing IP. Same with Can. Keef Cola, I think had their own manufacturing, but honestly, I couldn't say that for sure. And so I know a lot of the MSOs are sniffing around it. I've talked to some of them about it. Um, I think they're really interesting. I think the opportunity for them is, you know, this is the real branding opportunity. They could say, put Incredibles, you know, GTF is Incredibles in all these stores. They launch it nationwide. People know it. Now they have a better reason to go to GTI retailers. And I think it'll happen eventually. I think they're just waiting for a little bit more clarity or maybe even just the farm bill to get renewed. Because once that happens, you know, we have a few more years of clear runway. But also, if you've ever worked inside an MSO, and I have, things do tend to move pretty slowly sometimes. Um, like you, you get into this, uh, you know, these larger companies and things can move kind of slow in terms of getting, you know, initiatives done and who's going to do it and how does the compliance team feel about it? Spoiler alert, they hate it. Um, and, you know, I guess it kind of does fly in the face of like what they do, generally speaking. But, you know, it's a myth that hemp is unregulated. Like hemp is a regulated industry. I still have to test every one of my products. I actually test them to higher standards than most hemp because I do test by batch for all the same stuff that I test for in the marijuana uh, side of things. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of regulations across the country, just different kinds of regulations than you see on the marijuana side. And there's like, there's less enforcement uh, of those regulations, I suppose would be the biggest change. So it's interesting. I believe MSO is monitor this space. I think it's too juicy an opportunity not to, but it's not threatening the core of their business, which is flour, vapes, and concentrates. Yeah. Yeah. And I, like you say, yeah, I just, I don't view it so much of a threat as I do an opportunity if they're trying to like get their brands in the hands of more people. Cause that's really what this, this allows, or that's what this is allowed for really is like products to be sold outside of a dispensary. I mean, yeah. to be kind of blunt about it. You know? the big, honestly, the bigger threat to these dispensaries are is federal legalization. Like generally speaking, interstate trade, would kind of crush most of the models of these businesses because, you know, think about a cure leaf. Uh, it's fine. I used to work for an MSO. I think I'll just leave that one in a name. It's a small one, like a regional one. 
And we had production and cultivation facilities that were literally an hour away from each other. They just happened to be in two different states. And, uh, you know, once you built all this, like, kind of, kind of subscale infrastructure to service only individual markets, it's actually kind of expensive to switch then to a nationally consolidated infrastructure, at least in the short term, where you have to build now one big cultivation facility, because you can't really just take all your old equipment, let, like, smash it all together into a single sure. facility and then <laughs> distribute it effectively. There's also not really national distributors for these things. Like that expertise isn't even in the marketplace yet. Like I, who's, who knows if federal legalization happens, will FedEx, you know, ship stuff, you know, well, they ship stuff already, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> uh, my point being that, you know, the, the limited license structure was created by the government or by, you know, well, all these state governments. And then people went out and raised money, built companies specifically around that limited license structure some of them are more prepared than others to make the conversion for federal legalization. But I think it's a real tell that when they filed that lawsuit against attorney general Garland a couple of weeks ago, that that was specifically arguing that you should legalize trade inside the States, but not between the States because it really, uh, you know, takes away their tax burden, but leaves intact the system that they already know how to leverage effectively. It's kind of short sighted, but I mean, that's just, most businesses are just trying to make it through the next two to five years. You know, it's hard to be, you know, be thinking 30, 50, hundred years out. Um, and there's some that are better than others at it. I'd say, you know, true leave terrace and they're thinking about the long term, maybe cure leaf, but anyway, I'm not in their high level conversation. So I'm just speculating at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Like you say though, it, it that if there were ever to be a conversation about a threat, that's where it seems to come from. Like I hosted a debate between, you know, proponents of th these types of products and they didn't necessarily paint themselves as opponents of them, but they definitely are supportive of what you would call a crackdown. So I would say, in other words, they believe that all of these types of products, these farm bill products should only be allowed to be sold in a dispensary. This is in Illinois. And I've heard of different things happening in different states and where that seems to come from, like you just say, if there there ever was, you know, um, I guess some feelings, it would be, uh, it seems to be about, yeah, the limited license nature of these markets and kind of instilling that, ensuring that their market share is not threatened. And they, they view yeah. this- it seems as a threat. If if you, I'm sure if you could dig up all their original pitch decks when you know Ben Kohler went to go raise for GTI the first time, a big part of that deck was there's only four licenses because GTI is from Illinois originally, aren't they? Um, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it probably said something along the effect of like there's four medical licenses in Illinois, and we're gonna go get them all, and we're gonna own the entire market of Illinois, and here's how many people live in Illinois, and here's how easy it is to get a medical marrow. Yeah, like it's not the thing is the government is the one that created that system. And like the, you know, the, the versus that was the result of years of activism that just got us to like the best we could get to. And I was, so I was actually in like an activist group in college and that would have been back in like 2010, uh, you know, around cannabis. And there was a lot of talk of like, if we talk about this, you know, regulating it the way that we're talking about regulating, we're going to create a system that is going to create corporatism. And so like, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's really hard for me to fault MSOs who built a business around what the business the only way the business could be the fact that the matter is though dispensary the existence of dispensaries themselves is prohibitionist nonsense like you don't need to have a specialty retailer to contain cannabis you could put it right, right. in a convenience store right next to the cigarettes or you know mm -hmm. you can put beverages in a special fridge you know or just put them in a liquor store where people generally you don't have to be 21 plus you don't need to have a lock and key you know what the the security requirements of her dispensary in Massachusetts are, it's insane. I've been a part of a few of these build outs now. It's like 100% coverage everywhere, 90 day storage of high definition cameras, backup generators everywhere, facial recognition and car recognition technology. And then the police on one of the dispensaries we did made us mount an extra camera so they could look across the street at the Red Roof Inn in case you know, because of all the crime happening at the Red Roof Inn. And so like these build outs, I've talked to security contractors for them who say it's it's more intense than building something for the DOD. And so why do we need all that for cannabis? We don't. Uh, and when I talk to MSO leaders, it, you know, they don't seem to really think about hemp all that much, to be honest. Many of them are barely even aware that you can sell Delta 9 derived from hemp. They're more familiar with Delta 8. 
or maybe they've heard of minor cannabinoids, but they're not calling for that to be moved to dispensaries. The enforcement they want is to shut down the black market or the illicit market or the traditional market, however we want to call it. But everybody's pretty pissed about what happened in New York. And, you know, my answer for that is the same thing. And it's, to be honest, I'm kind of on MSO's side when it comes to something like New York, because the the thing that the government almost always gets wrong, and Missouri, I think, is the only one that ever really did it right, is time is such a factor once you legalize cannabis, that if you wait too long to allow dispensaries to open, you will just create a really robust illicit market that makes it impossible for even, you know, that uh, smaller operators who you want in the marketplace. If you want these small businesses to thrive, you can't give two years for the illicit market just to be able to sell without really any enforcement. And that's where New York screwed up bad. And that's where Missouri went really right. You know, Missouri is crushing it when it comes to the actual overall numbers. And they'll probably be a better at getting smaller businesses off the ground as a result. Yeah. I don't remember what the question was at this point. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, well, we were asking, I was asking about, you know, should these people view the uh, hemp, should they view hemp as a threat? You know, I don't think so. <laughs> I really don't. I don't, I don't think we're there yet. I just don't think the, the market size is like the potential is there in the long run. But like I said, these people aren't thinking about like the really long run. They're trying to figure out how we sell more cannabis, avoid price compression and make sure that, you know, the uh, I can maintain these limited license structures for as long as possible. The MSOs, if they were smart, they'd spin up small like offshoot companies uh, that were like hemp divisions of their companies. They put, you know, some amount of equipment into a small space. Uh, and then they start going at it because honestly, if you had to separate a business, you could probably also get the regular tax deductions that any company uh, should normally be able to get. And you could run even more profitable like sub business segment. You could get your distribution out there. You could spread your brand. But I think the reality is that most MSOs are really kind of in the business of retail in the long run. Uh, as much as they try to build brands and some of them have been successful, again, GTI kind of jumps to mind as one of the few that has like a nationally successful edibles brand. Uh, you know, their real success is that they have the right retailers in the right places. They build retails, uh, retail locations that people actually want to go to. And that's why they do so much money at those. I mean, even Massachusetts, once we opened up, you know, we have like over 300 dispensaries in Mass now. But when I launched Cantrip, there were only 60. But still, even when we got to 300, most of the business was still going through the MSOs or at least the legacy players, many of which in Massachusetts are single state operators like Rev Clinics or INSA. Um, but, you know, those legacy businesses that had been in the market before legalization happened and had those medical licenses, they already had like the the retail brand name where people were, knew where their stores were. They were showing up to those stores and they sold a lot of product through them. So honestly, I think in the long run, MSOs are kind of retail businesses. I don't know. There, there's so many varying opinions on the on the cultivation end, but most people just generally seem to think that MSO weed is all garbage. I don't know if I would call it all garbage, but um, certainly it does not hold up to a connoisseur's, uh, I think, quality standards. But they sure. seem to be yeah. they seem to be very good at retail and mixed at everything else, and so I think that's kind of long run where they'll end up. So I don't I don't see the hemp industry as a threat. Yeah. And I'm just curious to to close. Uh, I want to be mindful of your time. I know you said you had an hour. Um, just to close, uh, you know, ha- since I agree, these are mostly retail, and I'm I'm curious. I've been asking this question. What do you think makes? <laughs> I almost asked the question. What do you think gives cannabis operators the audacity? But but honestly, what I'm what I'm trying to ask is, what do you think separates this industry? Why do you think people even argue for license limitations in this industry? Like, what do they? Where did that even come from? Because the, to to use another example, like uh, restaurants or even retail, like retail is brutal. You know, let's just use retail. Retail is brutal. Like, good luck trying to open up like a tech store or a bookstore. You're going up against the likes of Best Buy and Barnes and Noble. Um, but restaurants, you know, we just accept 80% of restaurants go out of business within the first five years, but nobody's arguing for uh, license limitations on restaurants or trying to f- fight price compression, really. I mean, they are trying to fight price compression, but not by limiting the part. Right. Well, the, the price, yeah, the price compression end is like just something that happens when you have an entirely new, essentially commodity introduced sure. to a marketplace, right? 
the price compression happens because you open up stores in Massachusetts and there's two stores for th- like that are in, open in the entire East Coast for two months, uh, you know, and so the wheat is very expensive because there's a, it's a supply demand problem. So price compression is just kind of a version of the mean. You don't have that in food because food is generally sold in most places. So um, there's already kind of like the, you know, a, a supply demand match and the, the price compression just happens because you have a, a mismatch in those. But the the reason we have dispensaries or we have limited licenses is not because of the MSOs. The MSOs are the result of having limited licenses. Now, the MSOs then are further incentivized to keep it that way. So they do lobby a lot for it. But they're not the original reason that these existed, at least not to my knowledge. I'm sure somebody on Twitter is going to uh, tweet a very long thread about you know who was originally there for lobbying for these laws in the first place. But the way I remember it going is basically this is the best pitch we could get into the end zone as an activist community uh, early days. It was regulate it like alcohol, make it insanely secure. We're going to make sure that nobody diverts it. Sorry. It, no, that, I was about to say, oh. no, yeah, nobody diverts it because of the coal memo. Right. So they were trying oh, to keep it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They were trying to keep it in check. And that's to your point. That's the reason. What year was the coal memo? Uh, 2014, just okay. about the time Illinois was coming online, which God. so they, they point to, they often point to, like you say, trying to prevent diversion as as to why we had such a highly regulated market i was just trying to prove your point i didn't mean yeah to no 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 that's that's exactly right you know and it was it was really like we're gonna treat this like it's n- nuclear radiation so that people feel comfortable i mean it's literally built into a lot of these regs that you can't grow cannabis in a place where the public can see it um like that was a that was why we didn't we didn't have outdoor farms in massachusetts for like three years you know fun fact 10 percent of all commercial electricity in massachusetts is consumed by indoor marijuana grows in this state is that not an incredible statistic and that's wow. even after they like mandated leds over hps uh and has been true for basically the last four or five years because no one can grow an outdoor weed because you know the few people who are largely irradiating it to pass the regulations. Again, I'll have somebody else yell at me. I did a Twitter space this is where I mentioned this and people got really mad at me. And they're like, you can grow clean weed outside. I'm like, sure. But by Massachusetts standards, I don't know. Because yeah, the, the right. regulations are so tight around testing it that like, you know, you they're nonsensical when it comes down mm-hmm. to it. The fact that it's very difficult to get outdoor weed to pass testing regulations in mass says to me that those testing regulations are too tight because guess what? People have been growing weed outdoors in Massachusetts for a very long time. I used to buy a lot of it because I went to UMass. So mm-hmm. uh, not that I've ever committed a crime. Um, and <laughs> the point being that, you know, these the limited license states was basically activists. They wanted to put together something that could get across the finish line. Cannabis sentiment was not where it is today, you know, 10, 15 years ago. The push to get um, what was Colorado and Washington legalized in the same year, right? I think in 2013. And yeah. to get those across the finish line was an incredibly, it was a Herculean effort by a massive amount of activists and a few activists who really had been working on this for a long time and paved the way. And so getting that first, the first legal states took telling the, the government and telling the public generally, we're going to do this in a way that is so controlled, you're never going to have to worry about it getting to children. You're never going to have to add. all of these things, which are based on 80 years of prohibition and you know uh, 50 years of the drug war that people were afraid of, people had to assuage those fears. So we ended up with a system that essentially was advocated for by activists just to get the damn thing done. And that is like one of the problems of compromise. You get to compromise, you end up with a kind of a fucked up system, excuse my language, uh, because you uh, because like, you know, there was the, the reasonable system, which is just grow it normally and sell it normally. Look, I think testing is a good thing. I think there's probably more logical tests to do on cannabis flour. I don't necessarily know if a beverage should be tested the same way as flour that you're going to smoke. Doesn't doesn't strike me as two of the same things. Um, I think potency testing is important, but the way that we do it makes no sense because people are constantly inflating their potency numbers by working directly with those labs. And so like all these logical things, like the most sensible version of this could never actually happen because politics. And that's just how we end up in this country with everywhere. That's kind of being part of the democracy. And so once you have those laws, MSOs are obviously going to build businesses around them because they're required to by law because it's advantageous to, and because that's what their investors want. They have an obligation to their shareholders to create the most value. And then of course, because again, this is capitalism. Once you've created that system, 
they continue to have an obligation to their shareholders to create the most value, and therefore they must lobby the government to therefore entrench their their positions and further create oligopolies. And so, like, it's kind of like it's nobody's fault because it's everybody's fault because this is just how we're like how the American like we can go back and trace all this back to capitalism, generally speaking, and the fact that there is no uh, ethical consumption under capitalism. But like, this is just the, the world we live in. And so if you're not willing to play, you know, play in that game, that sucks. But like, you know, uh, it's just, it's just the reality of it. I, I, I it doesn't mean it's right or wrong. It just, it's just what it is. Yeah. Well, um, Thank you, Adam, uh, for your time today. And I just want to say one more time, drinkcantrip.com. Folks, the link will be in the podcast description. They've got tons of tasty drinks, as Adam mentioned earlier, low dose, high dose, energy drinks, everything you might need. Yeah, it's not catnip, by the way. It's can trip. Can or trip. Can, I hope or- can't rip <laughs> <laughs> i hope i didn't say that or were you just no you that? didn't i'm just oh, okay. headed, i'm just heading the people off at the past i get a lot of like is that catnip sometimes i wonder if i shouldn't name i can my company see catnip. i think i bought the domain name uh uh like drinkcatnip.com or something i have bought a few domain names that we're gonna try just to in redirect. case people uh just in case people spell it wrong <laughs> uh definitely plenty of people will but you know it, it comes uh, i pulled it from dungeons and dragons as the D uh, nerds out there will instantly recognize but um it, it means like a, a like a, a mischievous or playful act. It is actually a word. The T oh. is not capitalized. Um, can't trip. Interesting. Yeah. So Very level zero spell in Dungeons and Dragons, something that any, anybody can cast. Yeah. Right, I'll, I'll stop with that. Thank you, Cole. I really <laughs> appreciate uh, you indulging me and bringing me on the pod. Absolutely. Absolutely. We'll have, maybe have you on again. And I think I forgot to mention we met at Benzinga. I think I like teased that at the beginning of the oh, podcast yeah. and never said it. So we met at Benzinga. It was a pleasure to meet you in person. Pleasure to have a long format conversation. Would love to have you back on sometime in the future. So yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'd be happy to be back on. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Yep. Take care, everybody. <laughs>